Yeah, yeah, now oh, I see. Okay. Sorry for yeah. that. So thanks, thanks a lot, so, Luca, for the for the introduction and uh, good morning or uh, afternoon or uh, evening to everyone. Uh, this talk will be about Inspire um, and uh, about the central Inspire infrastructure components and the underlying open source software that we uh, develop and we operate. Uh, as you can see, I'm representing a big team today. A uh, huge thanks to all my colleagues uh, involved. And thanks also to the previous speaker, uh, Annes, who has uh, anticipated a lot of uh, um, uh, important notions uh, that will facilitate, I think, the understanding of this uh, presentation. Let me start from Inspire. Uh, as many of you know, is a directive enforced since 2007 um, to that define a legal, but also a technical and an organizational framework to establish a pan-European SDI uh, to support environmental policies. Environmental policies are still very relevant today uh, uh, to the current uh, EU priorities around, for example, the Green Deal, but also the digital uh, transformation. We could say that Inspire has been probably the uh, uh, the, the widest uh, and the biggest uh, geospatial data sharing effort ever undertaken. So what the Inspire infrastructure does is uh, to create an infrastructure uh, by putting requirements on data, on metadata and on services. And it's an infrastructure to be uh, created starting from the uh, spatial data infrastructures already existing, already operated by the member states. Um, more concretely, uh, the directive is complemented by implementing rules and technical guidelines. Uh, implementing rules are legally binding documents that explain what member states must do, again, in relation to the different components. So we have metadata, we have data. In Inspire, we have 34 categories of data known as uh, spatial data teams. And we have network services. In particular, we have inspired the discovery services to discover the data through metadata. We have view and download services to access and to download the data. And then we have the technical guidelines, which instead are not legally binding, but they describe from the technical point of view how the member states can satisfy the legal requirements. And these are technical documents that make explicit reference uh, to the standards from ISO and from the uh, OGC. At the bottom, you can see the uh, Inspire central infrastructure components, which are, again, the tools that we develop, that we operate, uh, that allow uh, member states, that facilitate member states' uh, 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 Inspire implementation. And these are the GeoPortal, the reference validator, and the registry. Just before diving into uh, each of them, let me just tell you some background uh, uh, about those tools. Um, these tools were um, initially created at different times at the GRC. Uh, using different and often very custom technologies. They adopted different approaches for the help desk. They were rooted into our infrastructure. So for all those reasons and the effort uh, uh, and increasing the effort that these actually implied on a daily basis, we have recently come up with a document you see on the right where we basically uh, put up a strategy for uh, ensuring the long-term sustainability of our tools. And the main points of the strategy are those you see here. So we would like to focus our effort only on the Inspire specific bits and not only on the underlying software, because for those underlying software tools, there are existing and major open source technologies. And we are, of course, contributing also to developing some of them. We want to harmonize the approach for the help desks and extensively use the cloud. Uh, we want to do all of these by keeping an open dialogue with member states, but also by um, involving other stakeholders and communities in the governance of our components, of the underlying open source components. And of course, OSGEO is a strategic partner uh, here. So let me start uh, um, the presentation of uh, the software components from the GeoPortal. The GeoPortal is uh, the central point of access to all the resources, so the data sets, but also the metadata and the services shared by the member states under Inspire. The GeoPortal does not store any data. It simply harvests the content of national catalogs and then allows uh, the users to search uh, those data through their metadata and to view and download those data through their uh, view and download uh, services. On the right, you see the current uh, landing page of the GeoPortal. There are two main uh, viewers, we call them, two main filters uh, to actually access the data, one based on priority data sets and one based on uh, special data teams. Let me start from priority data sets, which are data sets of particularly high importance for environmental reporting. Those data sets can be uh, in our GeoPortal filtered, uh, first of all, by environmental domain. You see the domains on the right, uh, air, 
nature, water, uh, noise, and so on, but also by environmental legislation. And you can see how many legislations uh, exist uh, uh, whose uh, uh, reporting is actually made possible uh, by INSPIRE. The second way to filter the data sets is by INSPIRE data team. As I said, we have 34 uh, data teams in INSPIRE divided in three annexes, Annex 1 and Annex 2 mainly including baseline information, and Annex 3 uh, mainly including domain-specific information. And we have conceptual data models for all of them. Uh, whatever is the filter that you apply, at the end you uh, access a page like this one, where you have a map and you have some numbers. The map and the numbers uh, tell you uh, how many data sets exist based on your filter and how many of these are downloadable and viewable, both for the whole Europe uh, at the top and for each country, as you can see at the, at the bottom. If you uh, select the country, here I have an example on Denmark, you basically see the full list of data sets with some filters uh, on, the, on the left. And if you uh, select one data set, then you get access to the last page, uh, providing access to the full content of the metadata, uh, a web map, the one you see here, uh, that visualizes the data set if a view service is available, of course, and also uh, some download options if a download service uh, uh, is available. Um, it's very important to say that uh, we uh, basically do not harvest all the uh, catalogs periodically or regularly, but the member states have to request the harvest every time they want. So, for example, every time there is a change in their national catalogs and they would like this change to be reflected in the Inspire Geoportal, they request a new uh, harvest. The people who are responsible for the national catalogs can also see a preview of uh, the harvest results in a sandbox and uh, based on this uh, preview, they can decide whether or not to push uh, the, the harvest to the public uh, interface. And in fact, on the right side, you see a screenshot. Uh, if you look at the very right, you see the date of the last harvest uh, of each catalog. So you see that the dates are really not all recent, but because this is left to the member states. OK, let me just uh, say a couple of words about the architecture that allows us to do what I've just presented. We have a backend written in Java. Uh, we have a very custom code to make the harvest. Uh, Saxon processes the um, uh, XML records that we get, uh, passes them to, to Solar, that in indexes results, and then serves them to the, to the front end. We also use uh, an API from our colleagues in DG Translation to automatically translate the content of the metadata from the national languages to English. So this is why you always access metadata in English. The front end is uh, very standard. Uh, let me just comment that we use Leaflet for uh, uh, the managing the web maps. Uh, the background is uh, the customized version of OpenStreetMap uh, provided by uh, our GISCO uh, colleagues, uh, as it was explained in the previous presentation. OK, we are right now cooking big changes in the geoportal, both on the back end and on the front end. Uh, first of all, we are um, uh, we are changing the backend, uh, moving it to the, the state-of-the-art uh, open source um, catalog application that is uh, GeoNetwork. This is in line with the GeoNetwork plan to evolve to a microservice uh, architecture. Here we are supporting the development of a harvesting module uh, together with some other uh, improvements, uh, uh, minor ones, like, for example, the improvement of the OGC uh, filter support uh, in GeoNetwork. From our perspective, it is crucial that uh, to ensure the sustainability of our geoportal. This means we always try to contribute directly to the main branch of GeoNetwork, uh, avoiding forks uh, as much as possible. And of course, in contrast to the current uh, geoportal, the new one that we hope uh, to be available in production by the end of the year will be hosted on the cloud, we'll use uh, container uh, technology. Important change is also on the front end because we will include an additional filtering option. So in addition to um, uh, the priority data sets, in addition to inspired data teams, also high value data sets, which are data sets of uh, particularly high value for economy and society that uh, were uh, uh, anticipated in the Open Data Directive from 2019 and that will be finally released in, a, in an implementing act uh, very uh, soon. Now, uh, let me move to the second tool, which is the Inspire Reference validator, uh, uh, validator. And let me start from the question, why do we need a validator? Who uh, is using it? Of course, first of all, member states data providers, because they can test their resources, uh, metadata, the data, and the, and the services against uh, the Inspire requirements. But the validator is also very useful for Inspire coordinators, both 
us uh, at the European level, uh, but also at the national uh, level to basically uh, measure, to monitor the INSPIRE implementation progress. Uh, in this regard, the validator is used since 2019 for the INSPIRE uh, monitoring and reporting that takes uh, place every year. But the validator is also a reference tool for the software providers that develop uh, uh, solutions for Inspire because they can, of course, check whether what they uh, allow to uh, uh, to provide, like metadata or, 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 or services, are actually in line with the Inspire requirements. And below you see the commission programs that so far have uh, uh, funded uh, the development of the validator, Arena and Elise on the right, the digital euro program that will uh, fund uh, it in the next uh, years. Validator is not a single software. Uh, it is based on a number of uh, components. Um, we always start from the technical guidelines that provide requirements for all the Inspire resources. In a first step, uh, from the technical guidelines, uh, abstract test suites are derived. So the ATS, these are the abstract or the high level descriptions of all test cases. These are then translated into executable test suites, which are the concrete, the, the, the low level descriptions of the tests. So the, the code that actually makes the tests. And then we have a software, uh, the ETF, the testing framework where the ETS are actually uh, run. And all together, these three components form what we call the Inspire Reference uh, Validator. Let me just dive a bit into each of those components, uh, starting from the ATS and ETS that are all available on GitHub uh, under the Inspire Validation and Conformity Testing uh, Organization. There are different repositories. You might see uh, that uh, we have one repository including all the ETS, and not surprisingly, this is where most of the activity uh, takes place. And then we have one different uh, repository for each uh, ATS. So there are many more, of course, and not just those you see here. Uh, we currently have ATS and ETS available for uh, all resources, basically metadata, discovery, view, download services. And here, let me just mention that uh, we will soon have uh, um, tests for OGC API features, at least part one of the standard, because this has been also recently endorsed as an inspired good practice. For data sets, we have uh, basic tests um, on the data sets, tests on the uh, GML encoding, and also tests uh, for the team specific requirements for Annex 1, 2, and 3 um, data teams. The, the, the last piece is the, is the ETF testing framework. So this is the software where the ETFs are run. Um, it's open source under the UPL version 1.2. It basically allows to validate any kind of resource in an SDI. It is consistent with standards. Uh, current version is 2.0. Version 2.1 is almost ready, although we still do not have uh, a target uh, release date. Um, what is important here? So in a nutshell, uh, an ETF deployment consists of basically a database uh, to store information about the test, like test reports, test objects, uh, a servlet container, of course, and the test drivers that are the real engines to execute the, the test. Currently, there are three. We use OPY for web services. We use BaseX for um, XML documents, uh, metadata, and, and data sets, and Team Engine, which is the OGC uh, testing facility. That, uh, so this test driver allows us to reuse the, the OGC test uh, inside our validator. The ETF comes with its own web application and uh, also a REST API. Coming back to the Inspire uh, uh, validator that is using the ETF, um, recently we have come up with a new um, user interface of the validator uh, that is offering at least two improvements. The first is a simplified workflow for uh, users to start the tests. So basically, if you look at the screenshot here, the user is initially only asked the, what type of resource do you want to validate? Based on this first selection, then the user is asked the other uh, uh, questions and based uh, on uh, uh, all the answers, then the test is automatically uh, uh, start. So this further this simplifies highly the the, the 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 process to start tests compared to the previous uh, version. In the test reports page, we have the uh, colors that immediately uh, tell us whether a test passed or failed, and we also added a lot of additional searching and filtering options. Uh, these are very useful if you think that uh, we get something like uh, two, three, four, five hundred of tests per day uh, in the validator. So finding your own test report might be uh, not so easy. 
Then for the Inspire users who are uh, watching this talk, uh, uh, just a reminder that we have two instances of the validator available, uh, a staging instance uh, that always includes the latest developments uh, like new bug fixes, new features, and this is used for testing purposes, and then a production instance, which is the official instance that all includes the developments already tested and agreed upon by the community. And this is released four times per year according to um, a, a specific release uh, plan. Now, let me move to the last uh, tool, which is the Inspire registry. And here I immediately start from the underlying open source component, that is the registry software. So it's uh, a tool uh, to create registers that uh, in turn manage what we call reference codes, like the code lists, taxonomies, enumerations, and in general, any list of things that uh, uh, you have in a, in, a, in a data infrastructure. These uh, reference codes are managed through persistent URIs and uh, are easily accessible by humans and, and machines. It's not only this, because the registry also uh, takes care of the governance of the process of managing reference codes. For example, it defines how uh, an item can be retired or can be changed or how a description can be updated and so on. So the registry is a, a tool for any data infrastructure, not just for the spatial uh, ones. Again, on the left, uh, the ARENA, the ELISA and the Digital Euro program that uh, have funded or will fund uh, the development of this open source uh, component. Where can you find it? Uh, first of all, on GitHub, uh, it's open source under the uh, European Union public license. Um, at the moment, uh, the GRC is the main uh, maintainer and developer of uh, the software, but we also get uh, um, uh, some contributions from other developers. Let me just acknowledge here the recent one from the National Land Survey of Finland. About one year ago, we moved uh, and we released version two, very different from the previous version, uh, 1.3. Current stable version is 2.2. Uh, I mentioned before the Digital Euro program, uh, that is a new funding program. One of the objectives uh, of this program is also to uh, establish communities around the registry, but also about the ETF uh, validator. So this is an objective for us. Uh, if you are interested to contribute to that, uh, with code, with testing, or if you have use cases uh, for which these software tools can be useful, please be in touch uh, with us. For those of you who are updated about the latest uh, developments of the OSGEO Live, uh, you know that uh, starting from version 14, uh, released this year, the registry is also uh, included. Uh, as usually, you find the software, you find an overview page, uh, the one you see here, and also the, 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 the quick start. And here, let me take a, a, a moment to thank the, uh, the, the, the OSGEO Live team for their great support uh, to uh, achieve this uh, result. And also all the translators, because in, in very little time, uh, those pages about the registry were translated already in, in several languages. So who is using the, the registry? Uh, many organizations in the public and uh, the private sector also, um, probably the uh, historically first uh, uh, instance of the registry, uh, that is the Inspire registry, is the one still most used today. Um, just to give you some numbers, it currently manages 10 registers uh, that you see here in the, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, those include a total of more than 10,000 items um, available in 23 languages and up to seven formats, so HTML, XML, JSON, uh, CSV. Uh, and so on. The register are, for example, to manage the Inspire data teams, uh, uh, Inspire code lists, uh, enumerations, glossary, and all the Inspire items. Uh, architecture, uh, again, we have uh, uh, all open source components here, backend, uh, again, written in Java, uh, Tomcat, Solar uh, for uh, indexing and exporting the results, Eclipse link as a middleware, here we use a PostgreSQL database, or actually we have always used that, but any uh, relational uh, database can actually be connected. Front-end uh, makes use of Apache Shiro for authentication and then the standard um, uh, technologies for uh, the UI. Here uh, you see an almost complete list of functionalities uh, of the registry in version two. Uh, I have no time to go through all of them, so I will just focus on, on some. Um, Version 2 simplifies the management of users and groups. Um, it integrates the ISO 19135 procedures for the registration of reference code. So it takes into account the different roles of uh, uh, submitting organizations, uh, control body, and the register manager. 
Uh, there is a customizable UI, a user-friendly editing interface. There is a REST API, uh, Open API compliant. And um, there is also mm, uh, a guided installation procedure, including the option, which is uh, very useful, I think, to migrate from an existing uh, instance of version of, of registry uh, 1.3. There is much more, of course, but I leave it to you to discover it uh, and to try it. Uh, last point about the registry is the register federation tool. So this was initially created as a test bed uh, to um, collect together in a single place all the national and sectorial extensions of the inspired data models. Uh, it has now become a mature uh, software and the plan is to release it as open source uh, very, very soon. It is fully compatible with the registry version two and uh, uh, to put it in simple words, it allows to create a register of registers. So a register whose items are other registers because it provides a, a, a file descriptor, including data and metadata about the registers and their relations that can be included in a federation. And on the right, you can see who, who, who or which register are actually uh, part of the federation uh, for, the, for the moment. Again, there's a UI uh, and there's a REST API available. Now, let me Marco, just close with... Uh, Marco, yes. sorry, you have to close uh, in I have one last one slide, Luca. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so yeah. just one last slide to, to close, uh, just to, let's say, summarize what I've just uh, uh, told you. Uh, and uh, here for each of the three components, um, uh, we have the uh, relevant links to the uh, repositories with the source code and the community support. On the right, again, a reminder of what is the open source uh, uh, component that we are using or that we will be using in the case of uh, the GeoPortal. That is it. Uh, here are my contacts. The first link uh, points to the slides. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Marco. Sorry to interrupt, uh, that I no interrupt you, but we have also some questions from the audience. So the most voted is, uh, what is the primary user of Inspire GeoPortal? Is the data actually useful for analysis, decision-making, business, or what else? Uh, that's a good question. So thanks to, uh, to, the, to the person or the people who uh, asked or uh, upvoted the question. Uh, the Inspire GeoPortal uh, is, uh, and the whole Inspire directive uh, was uh, um, uh, created and was pushed forward to um, uh, facilitate uh, data sharing uh, for uh, environmental purposes. Um, so there is not a primary user of the GeoPortal. Everyone can use the GeoPortal. Clearly, uh, users range from um, uh, European and national uh, public sector bodies and authorities uh, to um, uh, any other organization in the public, but also in the private sector. So it's a portal and user, including researchers, uh, including uh, uh, students can, can actually use it. Uh, we have some statistics about uh, the users, but I have to say that uh, we are clearly more focused on setting up the infrastructure, so on the data provider side and less uh, on the user side. So I think that our role as the GRC is uh, really to coordinate the technical setup of the uh, infrastructure. But uh, uh, in principle, as I said, it's, it's there, uh, it's usable by everyone. And uh, it's possible to find some statistics? There, there was another question, a little bit longer, but uh, similar and uh, they are looking for statistics of the use of the services. Uh, statistics, we, as I, I think I, I, I replied before, so um, uh, we have some information, of course, but this is not publicly uh, okay. shared on who is using the portal. But, uh, once again, because the focus is really more on providing the data. So again, the GRC is the yeah. technical coordinator of, of, of Inspire. Uh, but but this is a very interesting question, of course, and uh, uh, and and we have some numbers uh, also to understand what uh, users uh, look for uh, the most or uh, or search and and what they find or or don't find. The question is: Does the European Commission consider supporting commercial solution based on uh, FOSS soft software? Uh, yes, I mean, I think uh, this was uh, um, partially answered in the, my presentation and also in the in the previous one. Um, so we uh, basically uh, we, we have supported uh, over the years uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, open source uh, software uh, products and uh, 
and, and, and companies, of course, uh, uh, applying to our tenders. Uh, we cannot really be a sponsor. Um, what we do is uh, to try to, uh, again, fix uh, uh, issues whenever there are issues. And I can just mention another example uh, that just comes to my mind about the ETF validator that I presented before. There was uh, um, uh, there was an issue in Degree. Degree was, is a library that is also used by the ETF and uh, that uh, uh, created an issue uh, to inspire users. So we actually fixed that bug uh, in Degree. Um, in other, uh, in other uh, projects uh, and tenders over the years, we have supported also in directly or indirectly, uh, as for example, now in the case of Geo Network. So we are actually supporting the development of open source uh, uh, software uh, tools but you know we cannot really be a sponsor of course uh, for obvious um, reasons uh, let me just maybe um add here uh, that Inspire is completely uh, agnostic from the technology point of view. So uh, to implement Inspire, uh, you can use whatever you want. Uh, of course, uh, what I presented is about our own uh, uh, solutions uh, to ensure their sustainability. We are convinced that uh, going to open source uh, is the best uh, option. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, probably the last question uh, is... Uh, uh, related to registry, so what motivated you to create a registry where there are no similar suitable for project to build on? Uh, well, this is a more difficult question in the sense that the registry was created several years ago uh, at the very beginning of Inspire, I would say. Um, the idea of the registry was exactly to find a place to manage all the identifiers that uh, need to be used in Inspire. And the registry is probably probably the most important piece of the whole architecture because the geoportal is exposing data uh, you need a register so you need some some something that uh, stores all these uh, uh, identifiers and the registry is absolutely a key tool to ensure interoperability um, uh, if you do not have identifiers of course there are or there could be many many uh, issues so the the use of different terms uh, uh, the, the, the the danger to uh, to to make typos uh, so this is really a key tool for interoperability um I, I'm, I'm not sure i i I, I think there, there were not, at least at the time the registry was created, uh, uh, alternatives of that. I'm even not sure uh, what is around now. Um, we have found probably something that uh, has been developed in parallel. Not sure about uh, what is the community behind also those other alternatives. But the registry uh, is something we strongly believe uh, in and uh, the commission is also uh, thinking to adopt it as, a, as a, let's say, a, an official or a horizontal uh, a tool within this uh, digital euro program that uh, should or will uh, hopefully provide uh, uh, funding and support also for the uh, further uh, operation maintenance and uh, and development of the registry um, so, uh, and so and also in deals geo live uh, uh, such a tool or a tool like this one was was missing okay so just the last question you have to answer yes or no only um so now they can test uh, the metadata one by one. Uh, it will be possible to test the entire catalog in the future? Mm, yeah, this question would need probably some clarification, but uh, so you can test the metadata one by one, but with the validator, you can already test uh, uh, also many metadata at the same time. You can even upload a zip file. Yeah, but the, uh, probably for, they are speaking about one uh, single data set. However, the time is over, so uh, maybe you can answer <laughs> in the chat. Yeah, anyway, okay. the answer is yes. So if I okay. have to say yes or no. Okay, yes. happy to okay. continue the discussion in the chat, of course. Okay, thanks a lot, Marco, and uh, see you Thank around. Thank you. Bye. Bye.